A lot of people's worst fears are being realized about the power of money in these 2008 elections, the first since the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United lifted the cap on corporate spending. I had a chance to talk about that and other things with Wisconsin's Russ Feingold this past weekend. We were both in Madison for Fighting Bob Fest. And I asked him about his campaign. It's a tough one, up against a multimillionaire who's spending his money for access to government. We talked backstage at the Barrymore Theater, thanks to Karen Raibold Chen for this video. You've served long enough now in the Senate, Senator Feingold, to have some unbelievable achievements uh, under your belt. Tell me which ones you're the proudest of. Well, I think the things that I'm the proudest of are the things I've been able to do for the people of this state. They are the people who gave me this honor and this opportunity. So while I very much appreciate the chance to work on international issues, the chance to work on big issues like campaign finance reform, in the end, the ability to help people uh, get their jobs, keep their jobs, and not have their jobs shipped overseas, uh, which is very hard to do, is, is in many ways the most gratifying. You, as a relatively junior senator, volunteered to be on the subcommittee on constitutional rights in the Justice Department. Talk, talk about why you made that decision, and what do you think you, we're facing on that front? Well, when I ended up on the Judiciary Committee, which I, I wanted to be on, that was just as the Contract with America people had just taken over the Congress. And they had more ideas about how to rewrite the Constitution uh, than you can imagine. They were going to redo this thing with every uh, moral majority kind of notion that they had, whether it was banning a woman's right to choose or, or creating term limits or something like that. And I thought, somebody's got to stand up for the Constitution here. And it became a place where I was able to not only fight uh, unwise constitutional amendments, it also became a place where I was able to, uh, to fight some of the other trends that we're seeing now that, that have to do with trying to basically rewrite the whole idea of what the Constitution is as, as it is right now. You were the sole senator to vote against the USA Patriot Act. Uh, talk about that decision. Was there a moment where you just thought, I don't want to be that alone with my neck quite that far extended? You know, it never got to that point for me. I, I thought maybe there'd be some others. I knew what I had to do, and this relates to the fact that, in part, that, that I was chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee. I thought, I need to re actually read this bill, because I'm chairman of the subcommittee. <laughs> and so I read it, and I saw, saw things in there that I found amazing, such and, as uh, being able to go after people's library records without any evidence that they'd done anything wrong. And this was famously the, the multi, was it 400-page bill, more than that, that people were captured on video by Michael Moore saying, nobody reads those bills. Yeah, it's, the same, you know, it's a syndrome that goes on often in the Congress, but given the, what was going on, the rush to judgment, the fear after 9-11, the justifiable fear, the need to do some of the things that are actually in the bill, the FBI and others stuffed in there things that they've always wanted to do because they knew nobody was going to stand up to this thing very much, and I thought I had to at least try, and that's why I ended up voting that way. Why for the people of Wisconsin? I mean, you're there to serve the people of Wisconsin. Some people judge their senator by how much pork they bring back. Did that bring back anything to the people of Wisconsin to no, oppose Wisconsin the Wisconsin people Act? care about their liberty. Wisconsin people don't like people uh, checking out their library records when they've done absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, they actually believe in privacy. They believe that government should only have powers to invade that privacy uh, when they've actually done something that merits that. And this bill showed very little respect for that. So I got a great deal of support here in Wisconsin from not only Democrats and liberals, but a lot of conservatives. You know, gun owners are not a big fan of the government coming into their house and kind of monitoring exactly what they have and what they're going to do. So uh, this is something that really fits Wisconsin's spirit of independence. I don't get it. A guy who voted against the Patriot Act, who voted, so which is to say against big government uh, and government intervening in your personal life, a guy who voted against the bank bailout in September of 08, a guy who voted against the uh, confirmation of Timothy Geithner, a sort of um, bete noir of the right these days, how, are, how come you have a tough fight here in Wisconsin and you're up against someone who's pitching to exactly the people who oppose all those things that you too oppose. Well, they're, he's not going to prevail because people are beginning to realize not what the phony ads say, not what the national boilerplate from Fox News says, which is all you have to do is say a Democrat is the same thing as Barack Obama and talk about the stimulus bill and the health care bill and you're all set. It's boilerplate. You know, people find out that I voted against these trade agreements that shipped our jobs overseas and my opponents for them. As you pointed out, they find out that I fought the Wall Street uh, scam from day one. They find out that I'm the only guy that fought the Patriot Act and the guy that's running against me is for it. So 
we have to break through the wall of lies and the walls of distortions, but you know, the test is on November 2nd, and I think we're making progress in pointing out that in fact I have been very independent and have stood up to the corporate lobbyists more than any other member of the United States Senate. We've got about a minute left, but you also tour the state. You go to every 72 counties? That's right. Every year? Good research. Um, what do you hear? Because it's certainly true that the right are plugging into some real resentments. And how do you think you and our government can respond to those resentments? We can't just write off those people. Well, things went uh, in different phases during this year and last year. There was a period of intense opposition. The sessions were dominated by those who were very upset with President Obama, and in particular, any kind of health care bill. But when we got through that period, people were talking far more calmly but concerned about the economy. They want spending to be under control in this country, but they don't want corporations to dominate our political process. And many people talked about this lousy uh, Citizens United decision that I'll be speaking about and saying, hey, we don't think we're the same as corporations. Corporations shouldn't have the exact same rights in our democracy. And so uh, we had a much broader discussion. And yes, people are upset. People are concerned, but the question on November 2nd will be, who do you think is actually going to try to do something about it instead of just exploiting the situation uh, for political power? Do you have a word of encouragement for those of us in the independent media? Yes, I don't think things are going to be uh, nearly as bad as some people think. We're letting certain elements of the media uh, basically dance in the end zone and declare victory early. Americans don't usually like that. They're cocky. Uh, they think they've got it all figured out. The people will decide on November 2nd, and if they come out to vote, things will be much better than we expect. All right. Senator Russ Feingold, more at our website, grittv.org. We had no idea how bad this was going to get. And it was in the early 90s. Yes, under some of those Democrats you were talking about, where the bright idea was cooked up that, well, gee, uh, why don't we let corporations and unions and wealthy individuals give unlimited campaign contributions to the political parties, independent of the campaign finance limits that have been put in place in the early 1970s? This was the beginning of the use of soft money. Remember the no controlling legal authority? Well, there was no controlling legal authority to prevent a corporation from giving a million dollars Monday night to the Democrats and a million dollar Tuesday night to the Republicans and then Wednesday have a vote to pass a lousy trade agreement that sends our jobs overseas. That's exactly what happened with the unlimited campaign contributions. This was a growing cancer in our system, particularly in the 1990s, and that's why John McCain and I and others sought to and succeeded in banning those kind of contributions. People say to me, oh, it's too bad about McCain-Feingold being overturned by the Supreme Court. That's the only thing that's still in place now. So what we have now is a law that says that corporations and unions and wealthy individuals can't give unlimited contributions directly to the political parties. The Supreme Court agreed with us, and the right and the corporations were absolutely fit to be tied. They couldn't believe we had actually achieved something on a bipartisan basis for the American people. And they started to plot, and they started to work. And of course, uh, a certain guy named George Bush became president through a vote of the Supreme Court. And they got some judicial appointments. People that came before the Judiciary Committee and promised me under oath that they would follow precedent, that they would be neutral umpires calling balls and strikes. Well, of course, they did the opposite. They took every opportunity they could when it came to the campaign finance laws to destroy everything but the ban that McCain and I got into place. So what did they do? They did the Citizen United's case. Now, just about everybody I talked to who has studied the law believes this is one of the worst decisions in the history of the United States Supreme Court. These people who pledged to follow precedent overturned a law signed by Teddy Roosevelt in 1907, proposed and backed by you know who, fighting Bob LaFollette. Fighting Bob. 
And it's been the law of the land for a hundred years that corporations cannot use their treasuries to directly impact elections. It's always been the law for a hundred years. 1947, the conservatives weren't very happy that they were the only ones limited, so they managed to get through a provision in the Taft-Hartley Act that said unions couldn't do it either. And so it continued, and it was understood that that was impossible to do in American politics. That's why they were looking for other ways to do it. That's why they wanted to use this soft money scam. Court case after court case after court case reaffirmed that these statutes were valid and a foundation of our system of government. But what did these five justices say? They said, oh, actually, we went back and checked with the founders of the country. <laughs> and the founders, apparently, believed that corporations were exactly the same as us, that a corporation has every right the same as us, and therefore you cannot restrict their ability to buy elections. That's what they concluded. It is a lawless decision by our highest court. But four, but four justices disputed it, led by John Paul Stevens. A 90-year-old justice in his last major decision went up to the bench and they usually just announce these decisions. He made these guys listen to him for 20 minutes as he summarized his brilliant 80-page decision disputing that the corporations are the same as us. They are not the same as us. They do not have the same rights as all of us. And that decision is wrong on the law and wrong for America and an enormous danger to the political process as we go forward.